What an awesome intro. We are here with Nick Virgilio and David Frangioni. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Great. Awesome. Nick, it's awesome to have you here. I'm a huge fan. Um, I've followed you since the days of Spock's beard, and I know you've been involved in various other projects I want to talk to you about. It's great to have you on the channel. It's an honor to have you, as well as David Frangioni. You know, I consider myself lucky that even though we're a home theater focused website and, and YouTube channel, we've had some of today's best drummers on the channel. We've had Antonio Sanchez from Pat Metheny. Love him. Had, yeah, love him. We've had uh, Gavin Harrison. Of course, we've had David Frangioni. And now we have you to add to the collection of Sweet. awesome drummers. Love it. That's a, that's a great list to be on. For sure. Yeah. So, so one thing that really draws me to your drumming, it's not just your excellent skill as a drummer, which you could clearly hear in, in albums like Snow from Spock's Beard. It's the joy that you have when you drum. When you look at any video on, on uh, YouTube, whether it's Sweetwater videos or Modern Drummer videos or any, anything you have on YouTube, you always have this joy in your face and your heart. You look like a very happy, positive player, someone that really loves to play drums. Can you tell me a little bit about what your inspiration is behind that? Well, I mean, you know, I'm blessed to be able to play this instrument and uh, I've been in some cool bands and I've had a sort of a long and varied career. So, yeah, when I get to, to play music from behind the kit, I can't help but not be happy about it, you know. Um, so that's the biggest inspiration there. And then I also feel that when I'm behind the kit, I'm trying to give a performance, too. So I don't want to I try to stay conscious of, mm -hmm. of looking somewhat happy and not always just. So it's, it's it's impossible to not make the drummer face when you're doing something very hard, you know, <laughs> but I do try and I do try and be conscious of, of putting a smile on my face and looking like I'm not in pain, you know, that kind of stuff. I want, I want to sort of give a performance the best I can. So the people that are watching it get enjoyment out of it. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I guess that's one of the questions I have for you to start out with is what are your influences? What's your background? How did you get into drumming? And obviously you're a big, very big progressive rock fan. So who were your top influences there? I'm going to imagine Phil Collins is on, on that list. Uh, yeah. He was, he was my, I mean, starting back when I was a kid, um, you know, it started with my, I have a brother, my brother, Mike is eight years older than me. And he turned me on to like all the music that I listened to when I was growing up. So he turned me on to Led Zeppelin first. So I was big, became a big Bonham fan immediately mm -hmm. and these kinds of things. But then he brought home. He went to college. He went away to Arizona State. And during his freshman year, like the, the Thanksgiving break, he came back and he brought home Selling Lincoln by the Pound, which was an old Genesis record from 1974. Yep. And I listened to one of the real deep cuts called The Battle of Epping Forest. And it's a long song. It's real, it's it's full on English prog rock. And Phil Collins is so burning on that tune, plus that whole record. So I, he was my favorite drummer as a kid, for sure. Yep. I just, I got really deep into Genesis and anything else he played on. Um, so that was my biggest influence. But then, it, you know, it, it varied widely after that point. I was a Bruf Bill Bruford fan. Then I became a big Tony Williams fan. And as I got older, I got turned on to a lot more music. So obviously Bonham was there, uh, Carmine Apice, uh, lots of rock drummers, Keith Moon, all these kinds of things. And then I went, I veered off into a lot more jazz and fusion as I got into my teen years and, and it expanded there. But the early bigger influencers are like Phil Collins, John Bonham, mm -hmm. and those kinds of guys. You know and what's funny? really steered me with Tony, Cobham, those kinds of stuff. Those with kinds of Tony, stuff. were you checking out Tony with Miles and then with his uh, Lifetime or where, what era of Tony? Yeah, well, I was first turned on to Life. That was the first thing I heard was Lifetime. I think the uh, song Fred was the very first song I ever heard. <laughs> like, I mean, that blew me away. Oh, you know? yeah, that's pure blew inspiration. Yeah. Um, and then I went back as after and, and then realized, you know, he was a young kid playing with Miles Davis. Yeah. And then now in these days with YouTube, like we were talking about YouTube, to be able to go back and watch him as a teenager just burning with Miles Davis is just such a joy to see. So big Tony Williams fan. Awesome. Sure, so yeah. we got a Spock's beard fan here. I just put this comment up here. So, you know, what's interesting, Nick is um, I remember watching interviews with Neil Peart years ago, and he said one of his biggest influences in drumming was Phil Collins and selling England by the pound. So it seems like that's one of the albums that's like a musician's 
favorite, you know, because it's such an excellently well done produced yeah. album. I mean, you know, Phil did a lot of great drumming well past that as well. Yeah, for sure. But that particular record, boy, he was just on fire every song just and he had a unique feel. Uh, I'm a huge R&B, soul music, funk music fan. I mean, it's a big influence for me in my drumming. James Brown, Marvin Gaye, anything like that. I'm a big fan of it all. And right. Phil was a big fan of that music, too. So he pulled in a lot of sort of R&B type funk feel to progressive rock, which was what I think really turned me on to that, to him and the way Genesis sounded back then. Because he had, he had a deep pocket, a nice backbeat. He could make odd time signatures feel groovy that yep. kind of stuff and he had this sort of sloppy fun feel about and about his sound which just really appealed to me yeah now you know i linked up a video in our description you did five of your favorite phil collins drum tracks and you showed people how you do them i love that video because you went you went from the old stuff i think like uh nursery crime time or trespass somewhere around there all the way up to you know his solo stuff i just thought it was such an awesome thing to see that like, I don't care anymore, that kind of stuff, you know, sure. just incredible. Like the little ghost notes that he did in his detail was just great. And you captured all that because you can't really see that in the older recordings. The video quality is not that good or the sound quality is not that good. But you captured every little intricacy of, of those drum tracks in your YouTube video. I thought that was wow. awesome. I studied it a lot as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Genesis, I know you've done you've done some work with Steve Hackett. Didn't you do an album recently with him? I've been lucky, blessed enough to to play on the last few Steve Hackett records, just a couple songs on each record because he's got mm -hmm. a great band and, uh, uh, and and his main guys that he uses. But he's been calling me to play on a couple tunes on the last few records, and it's been a total blast. He picked some really cool things for me to play on. So, yeah. That's great. I love yeah. Steve. I, I did a live. I played live with him at the Carl Palmer show that Carl and I played at. Nice. Did double drumming, and Steve was the guest guitarist, Mark Stein on keyboards and vocals. And um, Steve is just an amazing player, as you know. Yeah, and, and he's uh, a super sweet guy, too. Great to hang and just talk with. And Yeah. Yeah, he's a really good person, for sure. I was yeah, fortunate. Yeah. I went on the cruise to the edge uh, years ago, and Steve happened to be on one of the excursions I went on with my wife. And, and I've interviewed him on this channel, but I got to spend the whole day with him. And we just talked Genesis the whole time. It was like a dream come true. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So I want to talk to you about Spock's beard. Obviously, that's, in my opinion, when I think of you, I think of Spock's beard because you were with the band. You were one of the, the founders of Spock's beard. So that band's been around since, what, the 90s, late 90s? Yeah. They, well, we started the band in 91, I believe. Oh, 91. Okay. Yeah. 90, I mean, it's, it's right in there. 90, 91. I forget the exact month, but I mean, it's right, right at that time. Mm-hmm. So my favorite album out of all the Spock Spirit albums is, incidentally, the one you can't find on any streaming service, and it breaks my heart, is the album Snow. I just think that's a musical masterpiece. The lyrics in it, your drumming is monstrous, especially in the opening track, the way you're hitting those 16 notes, and you just, it's an incredible album, especially just the harmonies of it. And you do some of the, bat, you do some of the singing in that as well with Neil, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it was a it was a good point for us. It was uh, you know it was the record right before Neil left the band. It, we were on this sort of high kind of arc from the record before, and uh, big double record, all that kind of stuff. It was uh, a, a lot went into recording that record because we recorded we recorded most of it analog, and that was back in the ADAT days too. So we recorded the two inch tape and then transferred stuff and bounced things around so it had a nice analog sound to it before mm -hmm. it kind of went digital. And our recording uh, engineer, Rich Mauser, who's still around and working, making records for the guys today, um, just did an amazing job getting all the sounds together for that record. Was that one of your last albums with Spock Beard? No, no, no. That was the last record with Neil. Then we with Neil, Neil okay. left the band. I became the lead singer, and we did um, uh, four, five more records oh, before, wow, okay. I, before I stepped down. Right, right. Yeah, no, guys, if you have not checked out Spock's Beard, please go on YouTube and just type in Spock's Beard Snow because you can't get the album on Tidal or Apple Music or Spotify. I don't know if Spotify has it. I know Amazon doesn't have it because I looked. But check it out. Do you even have a concert from a few years back? You guys did the whole album, Snow, on Yeah, YouTube. we never got to tour it, right, because Neil quit the band, and it was just one of those things in life, I guess. And uh, after 10 years or whatever later, he has a festival in Nashville called Morse Fest, 
he decided one year he wanted to put Spock's together and actually play the whole record because we never had a chance to do it. So we got all of all of us old original members and some and the the, the, the new guys too. Jimmy Keegan, who's our second drummer, still mm -hmm. uh, still plays with uh, not with Spock's now, but I mean he was when I became lead singer. Jimmy Keegan was the like the Chester Thompson, the other drummer, right in the band. Yep, yep. And then we have another singer named Ted Leonard, and they all joined us and we played the whole thing. Man, that's I wish that was on Blu-ray, especially if it was in surround sound. That would be incredible. It is recorded and filmed and mixed and the whole I'll send you the links for all these things, man. I'll, I'll make sure you get oh I appreciate I'll, that. I'll, yeah, best I can. <laughs> and awesome. and Nick, more yes. recently you performed at the Modern Drummer Festival. Yes. Now, the festival, this was the 21st edition of the Modern Drummer Festival. Had you performed at prior festivals? I was lucky to play at the 2003 Modern Drummer Festival. Okay. I forget. It was at a college. Yeah, uh, New Jersey. New Jersey, right? And uh, Portnoy was on that gig. Antonio Sanchez was on that festival. Oh, wow. Lots of other great drummers. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I, I was... I was yet yeah, that was a, a blast so to get a chance you know this many years later to do it again is yeah. super cool no we were honored to have you so what did you what was your approach like to get ready for the festival to pick the tune to because i know we saw a little clip at the intro but take yeah. us through the process since this was done so recently um you know for for the festival the festival has been a blockbuster success for anybody oh, who wants to check it out moderndrummer.com and you know, there's a festival button and you can go and streams uh, on demand anytime uh, and your performance is absolutely awesome thank you uh and uh so tell us take us through it well you know listen i, I I'm, I'm in my band now called big big train so any any chance i get a chance to maybe turn on people who don't know who big big train is uh I'll, i take the opportunity because i'm really proud of the band i'm in and i love our music so it was a chance to play a big big train song that definitely shows off the drumming because it's a prog band and I get to, I get to play, you know, in this band and, and do a lot of fun things, I think on the drum. So I thought it'd be a, an, I picked a track that I thought would be interesting for a drumming festival, uh, knowing that there's going to be tons of just amazing players on the, on the show. So I wanted to kind of do something that I lived that, that was up to that level as best I could. So um, I, I, it was a kind of a win-win all the way around. So I just picked a song, it's like one of my favorite big big train songs called East Coast Racer. It's it's in five. It's fast. It has a lot of it's it's very groovy. I think and fun to play. Really fun to play. A little drum and bassy kind of a vibe to it as well. So um, I decided to pick that one. And I've been doing more and more videos from my home studio. And um, I just set up cameras and, and plugged everything in and went for it. So where can well, we see? Where can we hear the big big train uh, music? Is it streaming? Big big train is everywhere you can get music. In fact. In fact, it's, today is a pretty special day. Our our latest record just dropped today. The latest record is called Welcome to the Planet. It's brand new. It just got released this afternoon. Oh, okay. So um, a lot of stuff going on with that band. And um, I've been in that band since 2007. Oh, wow. We've got tons of records and uh, lots of really cool stuff. So that definitely uh, 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 pimping out my band to the whole world. <laughs> if you haven't heard yeah, of it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Have you thought you about... about what what are your thoughts about surround sound music? Because that's really what we we like to cover here. David obviously is producing yeah. content in Dolby Atmos. I don't. Are you familiar with Dolby Atmos you music? Bet. In fact, we're we're building an Atmos room here at Sweetwater. It's in nice. the process right now. Um, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of opportunity to listen to the surround. I mean, to Atmos music that much because I don't have that kind of system at my home. But I do have a surround system, and there's all. All tons of big big train records are all mixed in surround, and I think it's a fantastic medium to. It's just you immerse yourself in sound. It's it's mm -hmm. so cool. And now with Atmos, it's even doubly cool. You know what I mean? It's just the way you can just have things kind of come all around. I was lucky enough to have the um, the speaker company Genelec came to Sweetwater and did a big demonstration, and they set up in one of our conference rooms. A, a atmos sort of system speakers everywhere and they played some orchestral stuff and just what you sit in the middle of these speakers and you feel like you're engulfed in music it, it was just absolutely awesome oh yeah yeah i'm, I'm a fan so your albums are in 5.1 like yeah. your big big so how do i how do we get a hold of that do you sell them as just go to our or... website and you can get bigbigtrain.com and you can find everything you can find links to get to everywhere right uh, to buy stuff and you can buy are it they all Blu -rays? online i'm sorry 
Are they Blu-rays? What's the format? Yeah, so all our live gigs are Blu-ray, uh, uh -huh. all mixed in surround. Uh, I, I think it's five and seven point one. I think. Wow, um, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, all around. So you could still virtualize Atmos with that. You could use the up mixer if you have an Atmos receiver, and it does a really good job. You'd be surprised how it could trick you into thinking it's native Atmos if if it's yeah. a good mix. The technology is just insane. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. So I wanted to, before we talked about, because I want to talk about your Circus Olay stuff, but I wanted to ask you about the one Genesis album you were on, Calling All Stations, that most people probably don't know about because it wasn't. Did we lose Gene? No, no, he's there. Oh, here he is. Oh, hey. uh, you're back. Oh, weird. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about your Genesis stint you had on Calling All Stations. Unfortunately, that wasn't a commercially successful album. I think what happened there was Genesis was cursed by the third singer rule, that it's very hard for a band to survive a third singer. It looked, happened with Van Halen. It's happened with many bands in the past. Um, the one thing that, that I think was really missed on that album, obviously, was Phil Collins' contribution, but the drumming was a bit stale on that album, and it seemed like it was all done in a studio kind of, overdubbed on music like people weren't playing together like i've heard in the past and i heard in interviews that tony and and mike rutherford didn't want the drummer to kind of stand out in that album they wanted they didn't want that to be the focal point what are your thoughts on that because you're on two tracks on there i didn't even know you were on that album I, I had to look in the liner notes to to see that and i mean it wasn't that the drumming was bad it just it didn't really pop out in the recordings yeah, well, all, <laughs> all I could say is that um, to growing up, being such a fan of the band, and then to actually record on a record and have my name as a drummer on, on a Genesis, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that that would happen. So that was, it blew my mind to get that gig. Um, but I, wait, uh, wait, how'd you get the gig? So um, I, <laughs> it's, it's a, kind of a weird story. So the guy in the 90s, the guy who gave me my, I, I consider it my break in the music business, was a gentleman by the name of Kevin Gilbert. He made a record. Oh, who he was in Toy Matinee? Toy Matinee, and he, oh, wow. uh, he was recorded all the early Sheryl Crow stuff. And, he was amazing. Uh, I met him totally randomly at a local ski resort called Mountain High outside of L.A., I was doing a sub gig for a drummer. He didn't want to do a gig. He worked for a, he was, the guys that put the gig on uh, had a, their main business was wiring up all the major recording studios in LA. They did Ocean Way and East West and all these big, huge studios. They built the patch bays and did that kind of stuff. On the weekends, they had a blues band. This particular drummer who I met just hustling in LA one day, didn't want to, they offered him this gig. He didn't want to do it. He had my number. He called, do you want this gig? There's no pay, but you get free ski passes. <laughs> I didn't have a gig that weekend. I like skiing. So I said, I brought my then girlfriend, who's my wife now. I said, you want to go skiing at Mountain High? Because it's only about an hour drive from LA. So we went up and did this gig. Now, this comp these guys in this band, they said they invited all these stars that they work for up to the to, to ski and stuff. The only people that showed up that were stars were Kevin Gilbert and his then girlfriend, Cheryl Crow. This is before she was famous, Cheryl Crow. So we talked, and I was already a huge Toy Matinee fan. I love that record. I saw him play twice in L.A. So I was sort of blown away that he was there. We exchanged numbers. About six months later, I know this is a long story, but I'll get to the point. About six months later, he calls me because there was a progressive rock festival in L.A. called Prague Fest, and he wanted to play The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway at this progressive rock festival. He remembered that I was a Phil Collins head. He asked me if I wanted to play. I said yes immediately, of course. I showed up. I nailed it because it was a record that I knew backwards and forwards, even that to that in my twenties, I played it so much as a kid. It was like mm -hmm. a no brainer for me. From that point, I did that gig. He asked me to join his band. He had a record called thud and he was promoting it. So for meeting Kevin, I then meet this drummer named Brian McLeod. You guys know Brian McLeod? One no. of the great drummers. That's, I guess it's so many people don't know his name. He's amazing. He's done a million sessions. He played all, he's the drummer on all those early Sheryl Crow records, plus mm. a ton of other stuff. Really groovy guy. He was in Tears for Fears. He didn't want to do the Raul and the Kings of Spain tour because we were starting another project. So he recommended me. So I got, all of a sudden, I got, I'm in the band Tears for Fears, like almost sight unseen on, on um, 
Brian's word, which blew me away. And I was a Tears for Fears fan. I'd seen them yeah. like six times early as a kid, too. So all of a sudden, I went from just hustling in L.A. trying to get gigs to meeting Kevin to all of a sudden knowing being in this sort of world of bigger players to having the gig in Tears for Fears, like within a year and a half. It was crazy. As I was in this now, Genesis is coming here. I was I was in London playing a Tears for Fears show and Kevin calls me and he says, I heard Phil Collins quit Genesis. You're in London. You should go find their management office and see if you can get an audition for the band. And I go, um, well, OK, why not? So I found where Hit and Run was and I had the very first Spock's Beard CD. That was the only thing I really recorded at that point in my career, the CD called The Light. So I went to Hit and Run and I walked in. I said, hey, I'm Nick. I'm playing in Tears for Fears tonight at Shepherd's Bush. And I heard, Phil, my, you might be having auditions for Genesis. I'd love to audition. Here's my band's uh, record. I'll put you on the guest list for the show and that kind of stuff. I don't know if they ever came, but long story short, about, I don't know, five, six months later, Nick Davis, who is the producer for Genesis and remixed their whole catalog. And he was working on it with them for that particular record, Calling All Stations, called me on a Sunday morning of all things and asked if I could send him some more stuff that I recorded. So I sent him a dat tape. If you remember what those were, Yep. other yep. things. And then from there, they flew me to England to do the proper audition. So this is just a, just a, the turn of events was completely wild. And it all stems from meeting Kevin randomly at a local ski mm. resort. So the whole, the whole who, you know, thing and meeting people in this business For is sure, so yeah. important to make those good impressions and, and relationships because it just, it changed my life. It really did. Well, but you were ready for it because well, you I, had, yeah, I mean, I prepared you know, myself. You had, I practiced you were prepared. I played a lot of all that stuff. You bet. That was the that was the key that yeah. that really happened. So so then you get the gig, and then let's pick the story back up from where you were going to share it. So you, you're in Genesis. Yeah. So I, I I I did the audition, and when I went and played, I went to the farm, which was their studio, mm -hmm. and uh, the studio where they made Abacab and all kinds of great records. And you walk down the hallway towards the drum room, which is lined with platinum records and stuff. Yeah. And I went into Phil's drum room and I sat behind the Gretsch kit and um, I basically just played to the songs, the demos for that record. It wasn't lefty, the kit? It wasn't. No, <laughs> I, I made him turn it around. Right. And uh, and then uh, I went home and then they called me back and said, we'd like you to come and record for real. And what tracks were you on on that album? Um, let me look it up here on Spotify. I can give you uh, um, Alien Afternoon. I know for sure. Let me I can't, I can't remember the title. So I'll look at it while I'm talking to you here. Um, and so when I went and did the recording, it was me, Nick Davis, the producer, Mike and Tony, and they were, yeah, we didn't jam together. I played to the demos that they had recorded. Mm -hmm. I think there was only one song where Mike played bass a little bit. So that was different. I was hoping that we'd, there'd be more jamming, you know, yeah. interaction. It, there really wasn't much of that. Um, and I just played along to the tracks that they already had. And, you know, they didn't give me. They didn't give me much direction other than just go in there, feel it. And then if they wanted a little bit of a change of groove here or there, I did I would, tried to do what they asked, like a session drummer would do. Yeah. And um, I just did my thing, you know, and it was very low key. There wasn't much stress. I was a little bit nervous at first because I was recording for Genesis, but that went away off fast. And it was very proper. You'd get there about 10 in the morning. You eat breakfast. We recorded for a while. They had someone come in and make lunch. And then you'd record for a while. Then you'd have at this fancy dinner. <laughs> it, you know, it wasn't whole old school rock and roll recording till three in the morning sort of thing at all. Now, you um, didn't tour with them when they went on. No, they, Near yeah. Z. And so Near Z is the other drummer on the record. Yes. And um, he, great friend of mine, him, great drummer. He's fantastic. He's a great guy and a wonderful drummer for sure. Yes. He ended up doing the the shortened tour unfortunately the tour didn't last very long yeah for him and the band and um so i didn't get a chance to tour no but you know i it, it led to other things you know i got a chance yeah. to do a session with peter gabriel at real world one you know and oh i didn't know that and, yeah and that turned well, into real world's amazing it's amazing so and what, that turned what room into were you in huh what room well, when I did my session with him, I recorded in his writing room. He's got a separate room oh, outside the building. Wow. It sort of has this kind of arcing top to it. Yeah. And he's got everything in the world in there. And it was me and him only. He was playing this tune. He was on Rhodes. And I was in the drum room where Manu Kache used to sit and play all kinds of great stuff. And he was singing and jamming. It was, I was killer. It was really, what an experience. Amazing. Wow. So yeah. that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is totally awesome. That Peter Gabriel and 
one of the greatest studios in the world in one shot. Oh. Yeah, That's and and funny. so in my band Big Big Train, we've done a lot of work there. We've oh, done a, a a live a live uh, thing called um, Oak and Stone from there, where we and we've recorded a bunch there. And I've stayed many nights in those uh, producer suites and stuff, and made a lot of music at Real World over the years. Thankfully, it's it is a fantastic place to be. And you're a multi instrument person. You don't just play drums. I've seen videos where you're playing piano and you're singing, and so yeah, yeah. So all kinds of yeah. I I've been playing guitar since I was a kid. My brother played guitar, so I picked that up too. And then I started playing it more seriously as I got a little bit older and same with piano and uh, keyboards and things. And it's just, I love music and I want to be able to be a songwriter. I think, you know, I, I love drumming and I'll play it for my entire life for sure, but I love the craft of songwriting too. So um, it's, it's something that um, I, I study as much as I can and learning those other instruments helps in that, in that. Right. Way. So what was the deal with Circus Soleil? I remember I emailed you years ago and you said you were, when you, I guess when you stepped away from Spock's beard, you said you were pursuing Circus Soleil. Didn't really follow through with that. Did you actually tour or did you yeah. go to specific shows? How did that go? So what happened was is that um, I was in Tears for Fears for about 15 years, from 1995 till 2010. Wow. But it wasn't like constant touring, unfortunately. They didn't really work that much. And at that period, at that particular time, around 2008 and nine. It was just slow. There wasn't much going on work-wise. So we were struggling a bit. And I had seen a bunch of Cirque shows in Las Vegas. And they have a whole audition process online. So I just decided, what the hell? I need work. I'm a musician. I'm going to just put my name in the hat. And I did. The, I went through the whole audition process and did a drumming and a vocal audition. And it took a while. Uh, I eventually got a call about a new show called Totem. And would I be interesting and interested in doing a Cirque show? And it meant actually going on the road and traveling, but they offered to let my family come with me. So I, long story short, um, my kid, my wife and my two kids, my kids were 10 and 12 at the time. We literally got up and joined the circus, went off and joined the circus. So <laughs> I went to Montreal and we, we started the show from scratch. And then we lived in Amsterdam and London. I played at the Royal Albert Hall for six months wow. with Cirque. And then we went all across the United States and up and up and down Canada. And we got to travel with 160 people from 19 countries. And my kids used to, got to take PE classes with these Olympic athletes. And I mean, it was an amazing experience. And uh, thankfully, the reason I got the gig was the two composers that made the music for this particular show. The show was called Totem. So it was about it had a sort of First Nations Native American vibe to it, which meant a lot of drumming because some Cirque shows. The music's cool, but it's very mellow and could be vibey, not it's not very taxing on the drummer. Mm -hmm. This particular gig would had a lot of drumming. We have a, we had a great percussionist in the in the show as well. One of the composers is a drummer and liked the music I made. So when he found out that I auditioned, I sort of that helped me get the gig. And uh, it ended up being a strange and crazy and good experience altogether because I had to play in a drum booth behind the stage. I wasn't, it was the first time I wasn't performing on stage in front of people. And that felt strange. It ended up turning out to be a really great thing because I was also assistant band leader, which meant, meant I, I conducted the band a few shows a week. I ended up singing and playing guitar on a couple of songs on stage. So I ended up doing a lot of other things as well as being the drummer in the band. I did about 1500 shows with Cirque over almost five years. Did you lose me for a second? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're back. Good. Okay. So 1500 you did 1500 shows in 5 years. Did you sleep? We did all we well at the beginning it slowed down a little bit. At the beginning we were doing 340 shows uh, a a year. We'd do 10 shows a week. So I only had Mondays off. We would do singles on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, doubles Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Man. And it was that kind it was the kind of show where they would go and they would set up the big circ tent. And we would have we would spend you know anywhere from three months, six weeks to three months in each town. So we, it wasn't like we were in a tour bus every night. We actually lived. They got us apartments, and we got to live in a city and could maybe kind of get to know it, that kind of thing. I live. We had a killer apartment. We played in New York City. The tent was at Shea Stadium, and they gave us my family an apartment on the Upper East Side on like the 40th floor of this high rise. 
overlooking all of Manhattan. It was, wow. I mean, it was amazing. And, um, that kind of stuff. And, and like I said, playing at the Royal Albert hall for six months in London, one of the iconic venues of the world. Yeah. So, uh, it was a really cool experience. I learned quite a bit. I was in the best shape of my life uh, because not only playing all those gigs, but hanging out with all these incredible athletes that you just can't help but get in shape because you get trained. Yeah. You know, hey, man, teach me how to do this. And you do. I mean, it was just incredible. It was so it ended up being a really cool thing. And it was a great it happened at a great spot in my life because I would work was slow. And it turned out, you know, it, it paid off my bills. I got out of debt. I saved a little bit of money. I mean, it, it was it was a good thing for my family. Mm -hmm. And then the reason I left Cirque, because I probably would have stayed even longer, was they had a, some corporate cutbacks. And the big cutback was closing the school. There was the, like seven shows that had schools like mine where they traveled. And it cost them millions and millions of dollars to keep these schools around. And because um, we had a, the kids... It was like Little House on the Prairie. There was 11 kids in our school with four teachers. Wow. And my kids would be in math class. They're going to be a first grader, or a sixth grader, and a high school kid in, in the math class. It was really like one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It was amazing. And uh, they closed the school option. So I could have kept my job, but then I would have had to homeschool my kids and while we were traveling. And it was – my son was the one who never really loved the road. My daughter loved it. And uh, so it was time to kind of go back to sort of, quote, normal life. Yeah. Wow. Is what an incredible you, story. Is that when you went to Fort Wayne? Is well, after, happened? yeah. So I had two, I, thankfully I had two options. My buddy, Mark Hornsby was already working here at Sweetwater and he was running our recording studios and he was trying to build a team of players. He wanted to have like a muscle shoals type of facility here, in-house production players and everything. And they offered me that gig, come to Fort Wayne, come to Sweetwater, be the in-house drummer in the studios and then do some web content. And I, so that was an option. And then I had the option of, of going on the road with uh, an artist. And after talking to the family a lot, do, well, do you want me to want to go back to LA and I'll go on the road for six months and not see you for six months? Or do you want to pack up and move to Fort Wayne, which is very different from Los Angeles. And I'll try this job here. And I chose this job here it was, it was the right choice for the family, kids going into high school and all that kind of stuff. And and, and that's what you do when you're in, you do a lot of interviews for Sweetwater. You interview I do a ton drummers. of stuff for Sweetwater now. Yeah. yeah. So it ended up long story short, it ended up being the right decision to come here because Sweetwater was, gosh, there was only 600 or so employees, which is big when I started almost eight years ago. And now we have like 2,600 employees and this place, it's a billion dollar company. So it's, it's just growing and growing and growing and it's nonstop. So my job, I did a ton of great, uh, I've done a ton, a million great sessions. I made some great records, played with all kinds of great artists mm -hmm. um, from Robin Ford to just you name it uh, in doing stuff. Met some of my favorite drummers in the world. Um, Near Z's been here. I've met, I've hung out with Vinnie Caliuta. I have Vinnie Caliuta's number in my phone now, which I never, <laughs> it's one of the things I never thought in my life. Oh, I could just call Vinnie. It's like, you know, it's. As a kid growing up, going to see him play at the Baked Potato every Monday night, it was like, you don't, you don't think you could ever kind of achieve the thing where that could be, he could be like a buddy, which was crazy. That happened because of Sweetwater and so many other great players. And then all the web content stuff, doing the demo videos and interviewing and mm -hmm. voiceover work. And so it's morphed into a lot of stuff for this company. And, and learning the gear, you know, Sweetwater. And the gear. So, Chuck Sirak, the founder of Sweetwater, and I go back. Yeah, long 35 time. Thirty-five years. Yeah, yeah, very, very close friends, and wow. um, and I've watched, uh, you know, the growth of Sweetwater, deservedly so, has been astounding, um, and I'm a big customer of theirs as well. I, I love doing business with with the team. It's just it's awesome, and to see how all the different tentacles of Sweetwater have evolved, and the recording studio, which Chuck kind of started. Sweetwater in a studio doing K250 sounds and and other very, you know, musician oriented, uh, you know, innovations, really, yeah. uh, even then. Um, and now, you know, you look at Sweetwater and you got to have amazing studio facilities. And I see all the gear that you do videos for. And um, as a fellow gear head in that lane, right? So Gene and I talk a lot about the consumer lane, but my roots and my day-to-day -day actually has more in the pro world than the consumer world. And all that amazing, amazing gear from triggering to sequencing to sound augmentation to sound creation and design, et cetera, it's got to be awesome to uh, 
you know, have that much access and, and almost be forced to learn a lot of different pieces of gear. Um, I do that a little bit myself and I see how beneficial it is to the music making process because your toolbox just went from like a couple of screwdrivers and hammers to a wall of screwdrivers and hammers. What do you think of that? Yeah, well, listen, I've been playing drums my whole life. And um, once I got here, uh, just speaking drums for a second alone. Um, well, let me take it say it this way. I was a May, I was a Mapex endorser my whole professional career. Mapex makes fantastic drums, no doubt. So when I came here to Sweetwater, since I was going to be uh, doing videos and stuff for Sweetwater and kind of promoting all the brands, I couldn't really be endorsed by anybody anymore mm -hmm. because I'm trying to help sell everything. For, the benefit for me was I get to all of a sudden now play everything. Like I never played on a sonar kit before I started working at Sweetwater. Just I never had the opportunity. Yeah, that's Gavin's um, kit. Or that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or um, or just all the different, all just the different nuances and brands that we sell is it's like a kid in a candy store. And you realize you start learning the 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 companies and their how they do things and why they do things. Mm. Now I'm talking, you know, Ludwig and DW and Gretsch and and Sonar and Pearl and and Tama and all these kinds of things. They all have a a reason behind what they do. And and to, to, to getting to learn the people behind the drums and then to play these fantastic products, because all of these companies literally make great products. It all becomes down to what you what you your, what's your favorite flavor, what your taste. That's, you know, that kind of thing when you're going to choose something like that. But I get to use all of it. So in our studios, someone will come in and they want, they want us to record a particular tune. I go in and I go, well, geez, what kind, which kid am I going to use today? Should I use the the cherry gum DW or maybe the the new Pearl Masters? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll pick the Mapex hybrid or something. You know, it's like so it's it's an amazing opportunity in that respect. You and, don't play a lot of electric drums, right? You do mostly traditional. Drums. I do both. Yeah, I definitely do both. And that's, so it's the same goes with that. So learning all the ins and outs of Roland's gear and Elise's yeah. gear. And Yamaha stuff and getting to know all those people as well and how much time and effort they put into the gear they make, you know, it's uh, it's taken. Oh, can I ask you? Can I ask you a gear? Can I ask you a gear question? Yeah. Um, I'm a very amateur drummer. I just I have an electric Roland kit. I just play at home for fun. Why can't they make a hi hat electric hi hat that responds like an analog? Like it, they they always no, suck. It's, it's, it's I mean, it's because it's it's not the real thing. Right. As it good doesn't as, feel right. It's just Roland. Roland has definitely taken the technology to a really high level. It's better now for sure. Um, and you have to get their digital stuff to really achieve it. But even the, even their lower line stuff is getting much better as mm. far as way it reacts. And, well, and the new VD, it. if you huh? look at the VD, the newest series, yeah, no, it's the, good, the, good the, right? the acoustic the sounds are getting series. better. Yeah. This, the hi hat has multiple triggers now. Yeah. And multiple oh, wow. I, mine's old, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, the, you have, yeah. It's, as, as I time mean, goes by, it has so many nuances. You play underneath it, you know, uh, you know, you do all the buddy, the buddy stuff with the windmills and all these different things. And it's yeah. all the sounds are different. And that's virtually impossible at this moment to capture, but th they will get there, like Nick said. I mean, yeah, they're they're getting closer all the time, but it's still, you know, it's still electronic versus analog. You know, it, it's just it's it's look, they've come a long oh, way. You can't since... get the nuance out of an out of an electronic kit. You can out of an, an out of a regular acoustic kit just because of the nature of the beast. But I they mean, are getting yeah. much better at it. I I have a TD fifty kit in my office here. I play on every day. It's a great practice tool. I've used it for sessions for certain things as well. And, um, you know, it's it, it, it can be really good for sure. They've come a long way since those 80s kits that Bill Bruford and Phil Collins used to play. I, I, I always oh, hated the sound. I was, just watching, I was just watching a Van Halen thing on YouTube going <laughs> through all of Alex Van Halen's kits. And I didn't realize he toured for many years with his acoustic drums were basically just like window dressing. He was playing yeah. Simmons. Simmons. Kit That's really? right. Live That's, most oh of the yeah. Time. For all the Sammy Hagar early years, 5150. I had no all idea. Stuff. Simmons wow. SDS five. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I went to all those concerts as a kid too. And I, you were just yeah. there rocking out. You had no idea. He was actually playing on electronic drums behind the acoustic. Wow. Drum. That's yeah, awesome. pretty awesome. Yeah. 
Well, cool. Uh, Nick, I really appreciate you being here, dropping some knowledge on your background. I didn't even know you were involved in some of this stuff or that the Circus Olay thing went that long. That's that's really an incredible achievement. Your kids are gonna freak are gonna enjoy that memory for the rest of their lives. It's just incredible that you were able to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, David, did you want to talk about um, some modern drummer stuff before we close out? Well, um, we talked about the festival earlier. I want to let everybody know we're talking about Prague. So the Carl Palmer yeah, let me show this uh, Applied Rhythms book published by Modern Drummer is out, reissued. It's absolutely awesome, this book. Right. And uh, so anybody who's into Carl Palmer, ELP, Asia, et cetera, and we have our Legend series that just – we're always adding drummers, but this is, of course, Neil Peartz. Yep. And uh, this is, so these are all the covers that Neil has uh, has been on and everything pertaining to those covers um, and, and lots more. So these are uh, for, you know, any of the drummers out there or fans of drumming, Prague, et cetera. Um, yep. You know, we're real proud of the books and we appreciate your support with them, Nick. And Nick is, a, as you would imagine, being at the level that you are Nick as a, as a world-class drummer, you know, we're yeah. very honored to collaborate with you and have you be a part of our, uh, our family of, uh, you know, influencers really in the drumming world. I'm happy to do so, man. I've been reading your magazine for many, many years and been lucky to be in it a few times mm -hmm. and uh, to play at the festival now a couple of times. It's a, it really is a true honor. I really appreciate it. No, it's our honor too. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of the family. And I think it's important to mention that Nick, not only are you an incredible drummer, uh, skill wise, but you also compose and you, you write the music. I mean, you actually talk about yeah. the music theory. I've watched videos of you talking about the time signatures. And so you actually write down the notes of the drums, right? Not all the time. I mean, sometimes I do. It depends on what I'm doing at the mo at the moment, you know, sometimes but you can, to... you have yeah. the facility to chart yeah. it if you want to. Yeah. And I'm actually getting into something now that I've never done. And I'm just trying to, to transcribe drumming music has always been the hardest thing for me to do, especially on a computer program and make it look good, you know, yeah. and, and, and be correct. So it's, an, it's a, something I'm learning now using this program called MuseScore. It's the only one that I have found that is for me that I could get into it and actually place notes in the right spot and mm -hmm. do it correctly. And right. uh, it's got that. That's an art form in itself. Well, we got to get you down to the drum museum, Nick. The Modern Drummer it, yeah. Hall of Fame Frangioni Foundation Drum Museum in Fort Lauderdale. We have Alex Van Halen's, some right. of his stage play kits. We've got Carl Palmer's kits. we got Carmine's Realistic Rock Ludwig Maple Kit. Nice. we got some great kits for you to check out. Gavin's been there, as Gene mentioned, and yeah. uh, you'll love it. So when you're down here in Florida touring or vacationing, uh, we'll, have you, uh, we'll have you as a guest. Sweet. Awesome. Love Guys, you. check out Big Big Train. I, I forgive my ignorance, Nick. I, oh, wasn't, okay. really, I wasn't aware of the band. Uh, I think recently. you'll dig it. It's a it's a pro we're getting a little bit more rock as the band goes on, but it like it's a proper English prog band that's music is very accessible. You'll love the musicianship in the band. It's got violin, five piece brass section, uh killer guitar player. I mean, it's 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 I'm very proud of that band. So yeah, if anybody goes out and checks it out. New record today called Welcome to the Planet that just got released. Um, happy to turn you all on to it. Awesome. awesome. You know, if I could get a couple of those Blu-rays, I would definitely like to do a vi article for you guys and talk about the sound quality and how you upmix it to Great. Atmos and stuff like that. So, yeah. Send me a, 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 an address to send it to and I'll get y'all. I'll get you absolutely next. absolutely we'll do that well guys i hope you enjoyed this interview it was a great honor to have nick here as well as david frangioni i'm i'm loving the fact that i can interview musicians now but always wanted to do this on this channel i love music as you guys know it's music is more of a priority to me than home theater in most cases but i love both but anyways thanks again nick and david guys don't forget about our patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics we appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to ask questions or suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.